Hi, I'm Stan Williams, and this is the Moral Premise StoryCraft Training Network. And today, in this episode, we're going to be talking about that all-important moral premise statement. Now, the reason we want to talk about this is that from our previous episode, we talked about the importance of ironic characters and the physical improbability of a story hook and how opposing values and conflicts are the psychological motivations for our characters. So we have to integrate these three things and put them together so that our story makes sense. And yet it's about all of that at the same time. So here's another way of looking at it, in a way kind of simplifying it. The audience must recognize your story's reality. This is what we absolutely have to do. Is your story's reality real to your audience? Now there's two types of reality. One is psychological reality, we see here at the top, and the other is the physical reality. We are both physical and mental beings, or physical and psychological beings. Now here's the interesting thing that you need to understand, that all actions stem from a value. And when you write, they must stem from a value. So, I mean, we, in our everyday actions, we are, we're taking those actions because of some value that we hold within our minds. All thoughts precede all action. So when you're writing, you have to understand that, that your characters can't just do something. They have to have a reason for doing that, and you have to understand it, and you have to communicate that to your readers or to your, to your audiences. But here's the opposing part of that, is that all values come from physical experience. Values are defined from experiences and explanations of the physical realm. And of course, that's communicated through stories. Stories told to others about others' experiences as well as our own personal experiences. So physical experiences told through stories define our values. Of course, in our own life, we experience things. You know, they say experience is the best teacher. So we experience things, and when we experience it, that really does define a value in our life. We, we touch a stove, we say, that's hot, I, I value my fingers, I'm not going to touch that stove again. That's why a mother can tell her kid just so many times, don't touch the stove, don't touch the stove. But the kid doesn't really learn until he touches the stove. Now he learns. So personal experience is really powerful. But stories are that secondary level, or that second tier of passing on values through experiences. So we have these two things then, uh, where psychological values drives physical actions, and a physical action drives psychological values. And storytellers need to tie these things together in a very natural, organic sort of way. We call this the values action values cycle. So how are we going to do that? Well, the answer to that is the moral premise statement. This helps us understand and merge the physical and aspect, uh, physical and psychological aspect of our real lives and the lives of our characters. And the key ingredient in all of this is that the psychological always leads to the physical. We always understand what's driving our character psychologically and that leads to some natural, organic, and common sense physical action. So here's the structure of the statement. It's really four pieces. There's a psychological vice, there's a physical detriment, a psychological virtue, and a physical betterment. And it reads like this. Some psychological vice leads to some physical detriment. But then there's a transformation that occurs to some psychological virtue which then leads to some physical betterment. And that rep is represented by uh, a transformation in the physical realm. And of course, this transformation in the physical realm is simply the metaphor for what's happened over here in the psychological realm or the moral realm. So that's the structure. And if we want to uh, put it together and look, so it looks more like a sentence, we do it this way. Some generic vice or weakness leads to some physical detriment or something bad. But some psychological virtue or strength leads to some physical betterment or something good. Now that sounds really simple. 
Um, but it's very elegant and it's very sophisticated because it applies to everything in, uh, in the art and craft of telling stories, whether you're writing a novel or making a movie. Again, the psychological leads to the physical. So here's an example, liar, liar. Vice, a deceptive heart. Physical detriment, rejection. Virtue, a truthful heart. Physical betterment, acceptance. And so it reads, a deceptive heart leads to rejection, but a truthful heart leads to acceptance. Now, this is interesting because in all aspects of the story, you'll see rejection, you'll see deception, you'll see truth-telling, and you'll see acceptance in a multiple different ways, whether it's uh, Jim Carrey's character's uh, playing as a lawyer or whether he's a dad or whether he's a husband or whether he's the driver of his car. All those things get involved. And so you have deception and rejection, truth and acceptance on all these different levels. Uh, is he, uh, when he's deceptive with his, um, his boss at work, he's rejected. When he's uh, deceptive with his kid, he's rejected. When he's deceptive with his wife, he's, uh, he's rejected. And when his car, which represents him metaphorically, stops paying its parking tickets, it gets compounded or it gets put in the compound. It's rejected. So uh, the, the concepts of the virtues and the vices, uh, the, the physical betterments and detriments apply to all different sort of subplots in the story. Here's some other ones. In Terminator 2, selfishness leads to death but sacrifice leads to life. Remember at the end there, the, the gov sacrifices himself and lowers himself into the molten pit of fire so that he can destroy that last ship that is enslaving humanity. And of course that leads to, to life. In all the James Bond type movies that uh, we see a, a, a moral premise that could be stated this way. The pursuit of power leads to defeat, but the pursuit of justice leads to success. And you see here where the villains in the James Bond movies believe that they're, they're going to achieve happiness and satisfaction and actualization in life by pursuing power. But of course that leads ultimately to their defeat. And the James Bond and the, and the, and the powers of democracy believe that the pursuit of justice will lead to success. And, and of course the, the movie leads us to that, that conclusion. In the movie Where the Heart Is, uh, Relying on fate leads to despair, but relying on free will leads to hope. Later on, there will be an episode where I, I deal more with, uh, and, and we, we deconstruct the movie and the book, Billy Letts' book, Where the Heart Is. Uh, and we see this, that uh, Nova Lee is relying tremendously on fate early on in the movie. And of course, that leads to her despair. But when she begins to understand that she can live a life of being empowered, and free will, and that it's not fate that controls her life, but it's her own decisions that controls her life. That gives her hope, and the movie ends redemptively. All right, now let's look at um, uh, some examples here. Uh, one, sometimes you'll see the moral premise articulated toward the end of the movie. It isn't always articulated. Sometimes it's, it's kind of hidden and subliminal. Uh, movie audiences don't walk out, of movie, walk out of movies saying, oh, the moral premise is this, that, and the other thing. They don't do that. The whole moral premise concept is very, very subliminal. But it's built into everything we write about and everything we, we plot out. So here is uh, the moral premise for um, The Incredibles. Battling adversity alone leads to weakness and defeat. But battling adversity as a family leads to strength and victory. Let me read that again. Battling adversity alone leads to weakness and defeat. But battling adversity as a family leads to strength and victory. Now you'll notice that that moral premise statement is very generic in that it applies to everybody in the audience, right? Um, not everyone in the audience are superheroes that battle uh, evil villains trying to take over the world. But in fact, the Incredibles in the movie, you know, uh, the Pars, uh, are really representations of everyone in the audience. And the metaphor for the struggles in our individual lives 
are, although they're not villains trying to take over the world, nonetheless, that's what we see in the movie. It's an extreme example of reality. But it's the reality that we believe in is not the super um, family fighting the super villains, but it's this internal moral premise that when we battle adversity alone, um, we, 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 it leads to weakness and defeat. But when we do it together as a family, it leads to strength and victory. Now, that sometimes is articulated. And here, just before the final climactic battle scene, you'll see it articulated. Let's watch this clip. Wait here and stay hidden. I'm going in. While what? I watch helplessly from the sidelines? I don't think so. I'm asking you to wait with the kids. And I'm telling you, not a chance. You're my husband, I'm with you. For better or worse. I have to do this alone. What is this to you? Playtime? No. So you can be Mr. Incredible again? No! Then what? What is it? I'm not... Not what? I'm, I'm not strong enough. Strong enough? And this will make you stronger? Yes. No! That's what this is? Some sort of workout? I can't lose you again! I can't. Not again. I'm not strong enough. If we work together, you won't have to be. I don't know what will happen. Hey, we're superheroes. What could happen? Of course, the irony of the situation there, what can happen, and then the claw coming down and crushing the, the van, uh, is ironic and it makes us it makes us laugh. But that dialogue that we just listened to was just perfect in terms of taking that the, the ironic characters uh, of of the incredible family and their their problems and their and their differences and the the hook of a family trying to battle the evil and save the world and then the the conflict of values of battling adversity alone versus uh, battling it together as a family. Uh, those three things that we talked about in the lap last episode come together in this movie and in and that dialogue line between Bob and his wife, between, between the pars, explicitly states what the movie is about and how they have to fight and work together. And of course, if we when we, when we look at the whole movie later, as we will in later episodes, you'll see that this moral premise concept is true for every one of the characters, even for Buddy Pine, the villain, uh, and for Bob Parr and his whole family uh, at every point, and at, at every plot point, every turning point, this moral premise is tested. Now, just to reinforce, let's understand that this moral premise concept is literally the story's dramatic thrust. It's the psychological inner story is what leads to the physical outer story. Thus, the protagonist's thoughts precede the protagonist's decisions. Is that what you're doing when you're writing a protagonist's actions or their decisions? Or, or, or do you understand the thoughts and the moral values that are driving that decision? You need to. That will make your character stronger. Thus, the values of the character motivate their action. You all had a value that you wanted to watch this episode today, and that led you to actually take the action to watch it. Values always precede action. A moral cause leads to a physical effect. All stories must, must follow natural cause and effect relationships. And in this case, what we're talking about with the moral premise, the moral cause is what's psychological and it leads to the physical action. And that the, the physical story is the metaphor for what we're thinking. So the moral story is metaphored in the physical story. The physical story is the metaphor for the moral story or what's going on. Or another way of saying it is what the story is about over here in the physical realm uh, is, literally a middle, um, is simply a metaphor for what the story is really about over here in the psychological realm. Now here are a couple of diagrams to help you kind of see what's going on. Uh, this is the psychological arc 
versus the physical arc. In a, in a good, successful story, things must change. So in a redemptive movie, uh, like Liar Liar, we have a psychological spine that deals with a deceptive heart and how that changes through a moment of grace to a truthful heart in order to reach our goals. Now that's what's happening in the psychological spine. In the physical spine, we see that rejection and acceptance are the precipitants of a deceptive heart or a truthful heart. So you might think of this as the psychological spine is uh, kind of leads or is pulling down the, re the physical spine. So the, the more deceptive we are, the more rejection. So there's kind of like an, think of this as a force pulling this down. Where over here, uh, we have this truthful heart and this truthful moral presence, and it's pulling up the acceptance. So you'll always see the, the physical spine lagging or falling behind the psychological spine, or the outer journey always follows or lags the inner journey. Don't get one ahead of the other. The, you'll lose the audience at a subliminal level. Uh, in a tragic ending, we have simply the opposite. Uh, this particular example is from Todd Fields' In the Bedroom. If you haven't seen that, watch it. It's a, it's a tragic movie, uh, but it's a true and very well-developed and, um, and structured movie. And here, uh, we have ignoring moral principles is the psychological spine. And at the moment of grace in this movie, our main characters played by Tom Wilkinson and Sissy Spacek, who um, are, are, begin to flaunt moral precepts. They don't get better, they get worse. And rather than saving their son and their lives, they end up losing their, their lives and their son, and their son's lives. And of course, that precedes um, and the physical attributes of the story, or what we see on the screen. So ignoring precepts uh, leads to bitterness. And flaunting moral precepts leads to murder and killings. Of course, this is based on a book called The Killings. Again, the psychological spine is uh, pushing down is pushing down this bitterness. It's preventing this. It's, it's leading it. So the more they ignore the moral precepts, the more bitterness there is. And the more they flaunt the moral precepts, the closer they get to murder. Now, thinking again, just in kind of summary about the um, the physical spine and the psychological story, we, we, we have these different terms that are used in the industry uh, for the physical story and the psychological story. Uh, there's external, explicit, outward, objective, temporal, invisible. These terms all are pretty synonymous and they refer to the physical story. We have terms like internal, implicit, inward, emotional, spiritual, or invisible. These are all the same thing. Don't be confused. And they all deal with the psychological story. Okay, here's just one, uh, another example to kind of show you how this works and how when the moral premise is, is about something true psychologically, uh, that there's a, a possibility that this story is going to have uh, good sales. It's going to do good at the box office. So in my original research, I went way back in history, uh, 1991, and I looked at two, two very similar movies. One was City Slickers. Uh, and here the moral premise was fidelity to family leads to happiness, but infidelity leads to sadness. Now this is a true portrayal of natural law uh, stated in the moral premise. And of course, every character in the movie, whether it's Billy Crystal's character or Bruno Kirby's character, uh, are... It, it, to the extent that they're, they're, uh, they show fidelity to their family, they're happy. But when they show infidelity, it leads to sadness. And that's true. And that was a tr terrifically uh, successful movie. In 1991, it did $116 million, uh, at the box office, and in just the domestic box office, and it was a huge success. But later on, they said, hey, that was so good, let's do another movie. So they took the same characters, put them in the same setting, same sort of genre film. But now they, they inadvertently, they flipped the moral premise. Now the moral premise ended up not pursuing illicit wealth leads to sadness. In other words, if we 
go after wealth and money and gold that's not really ours, we'll be happy. That was the whole idea. So not pursuing illicit wealth leads to sadness, but obtaining illicit wealth leads to happiness. And they end up with this pile of gold that's clearly not theirs. They know it's not theirs, even though it's back in history. They, they rationalize that they can, they can be happy if they have all this gold. Even though uh, lying to their wife, and, and, and even and in this film, lying to their wives is acceptable, uh, as long as they're rich. And of course, this is a false portrayal of natural law. Uh, money and gold, especially if it's not yours, does not lead to happiness. And, it, uh, and lying to your wife doesn't lead to happiness. And the consequence of all that was that the movie bombed. It did only $30 million at the box office, and that was in 1994. Okay, here's an opportunity to exercise what we've been learning. Based on your previous ideas, perhaps from the previous episode of a, of a hook, a log line, and the conflict of values, rough out a moral premise statement and put it in this form where some vice or weakness leads to something bad or physical detriment, but how some strength or virtue leads to something good or some physical betterment. Make sure that your vice or virtue are opposing, not different, and that your physical detriments and betterments are in the same genre. They're about the same sort of thing, not something just different and unrelated. Make sure they're absolutely physically related. So stop the playback at this moment, at this time, uh, work the exercise, and when you're done, click play and we'll continue. All right, let's look at an example now of how the moral premise statement is used in a movie, a real popular movie like Die Hard, uh, where Bruce Willis battles uh, a tower full of terrorists, and we think in the physical level, we say, well, John McClane dies hard. Uh, it's hard for these terrorists to kill him. But in fact, that's, or that's what the story is about, but in fact, what the story is really about is how John McClane's love for his wife, Holly, dies hard. It's really a love story, and what a man uh, is willing to do or comes to understand what he has to do to earn the love of his wife back. Well, the moral premise of Die Hard can be stated like this. Arrogance and self-preservation lead to separation and defeat, but humility and sacrifice lead to victory in marriage. Let's read that again. Arrogance and self-preservation, and we're talking about John McClain here, we're talking about Holly, and we're talking about Hans Gruber, lead to separation and defeat. In other words, when we're arrogant and thinking only of ourselves, we're going to lead to separation and defeat. But humility and sacrifice leads to victory in marriage. All right. Now, let's look at an early scene from the movie. And I want to point out a few things here that are copacetic with that, that moral premise statement. <clears throat> in this early scene that you're going to watch, notice how John McClane is cleaning up and he's all neat and tidy and, uh, and his wife Holly, although they're separated, not only she's now living in LA and he's a New York cop uh, and he's kind of coming back trying to get her back, but he doesn't, he's doing it wrong and he's being arrogant and he's being all clean, but notice how the, the, the director, they, he keeps them separated. In fact, even when they do come together, when they first see each other, there's no kiss. <clears throat> and a watch is mentioned, a Rolex watch is mentioned, but we don't see it quite yet. Notice how this is mentioned early on, because we're going to see it later at the end of the movie, and it's very important as a, a metaphor for what's going on between these characters. So, Let's watch this clip and pay attention to this bathroom scene and to this scene here and, and the separation that these two characters are experiencing and their attitudes. Notice their attitudes. Both John McClane and his wife Holly are both arrogant um, as well as is another character and we know what happens to him. Everyone? Oh, we've been sticking with Spears. <laughs> of course he has. She was made for the business. Tough as nails. 
I was hoping you made that flight. Show him the watch. <clears throat> Later. Well, go on, show him. What are you embarrassed? It's just a small token of appreciation for all our hard work. It's a Rolex. I'm sure I'll see you later. Is there a place where I could wash up? Sure. I have to forgive Ellis. He gets very depressed this time of year. He thought he was God's greatest gift, you know? Yeah, I know the type. I think he's got his eye on you. It's okay, I have my eye on his private bathroom. Where are you staying? Things happened so fast, I didn't get a chance to ask you on the phone. Cappy Roberts retired out here. Oh, yeah? Tell me I could bunk in with him. Cappy retired, huh? Where does he live? Ramona. <laughs> Pomona. 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 Yeah. Glad <laughs> you'll be in the car half the time. Why don't we make it easy? I have a spare bedroom. I mean, it's not huge or anything, but kids would love to have you at the house. They would have. I would, too. <laughs> Come on. Sorry. I missed you. I guess you didn't miss my name, though, huh? Except maybe when you're signing checks. Since when did you start using Ms. Gennaro? The Japanese company. They figure a married woman's got You are a married woman, Holly. You're married to me. We're well, we gonna have this Remember, conversation again. We did this in July. We I never finished this conversation in July. I had yeah, to take right. it. Right. No matter what the consequences, no what matter what it did to our marriage, it you had to take it. Didn't do anything this to our marriage except maybe change your idea of what our marriage. I don't should think be. you have a clue as to what my idea of I our marriage exactly should be. I know exactly what your idea of our marriage should be, Mr. Nero. I... Excuse me. Um, Mr. Takagi is looking for you. He, he wants you to say something to the troops. Thank you. Speech time. Be back in a few minutes. That was great, John. Good job. Very mature. All right, now I want you to notice several things about the clip that we just watched. First off, notice how he was arrogant, clean, separated, no kiss, and we didn't see the watch. Also notice that uh, there was a couple things that they were thinking, uh, like when they're thinking about getting together again physically, and we can't read their minds, but the director tells us what they're thinking, not only by their own nonverbal, but when that young couple breaks into the bathroom kind of looking for a private place to get it on. That tells us what they're thinking. And then later on, when Holly is arguing with John about uh, what it means to be married and have a career of her own, she's thinking about uh, what it means to be a professional woman. And so that we know what she's thinking about, her secretary bursts into the room and says, uh, Mr. Katati wants you to say something to the troops. And so we know what Holly is thinking. Those are visual metaphors for what is invisible. And so throughout the whole movie, we see these evidences of arrogance that are visibly metaphored uh, in, in, in the story. So now we're going to take that whole concept of taking what's invisible and making it visible, and we're going to move it from Act 1 into Act 3. So here on the right, I have three shots from Act 3. Um, notice how the arrogance that John McClane 
represents here at the beginning turns into kind of a, a, a martyred humbleness. I mean, he's still very confident, but he's no longer worrying about being clean because here he's very clean, but at the end, he, I mean, he's a bloody mess. And here at the beginning, they're separated physically, but at the end, uh, where there's no kiss here, now there's a, a big kiss and they're united and they don't really care about what they look like. But more importantly is this watch. Where we don't see the watch at the beginning, the watch is this invisible metaphor for the arrogance that we don't literally see until we really need to see it. And that's at the end. And here at the end, on Holly's wrist is this Rolex watch. And we don't see it very closely, but it is in fact the thing that Hans Gruber, the epitome of arrogance, is holding on to uh, and preventing him from falling to his death. And it's only when John McClain reaches over Holly's arm and unlatches the watch, the watch of arrogance, that that no longer gives Hans Gruber anything to hold on to, and he falls to his death. So the epitome of arrogance leads to defeat. But humility and willing to sacrifice, John willing to sacrifice his life, he comes, uh, Gruber, as a, a willing martyr, uh, leads to victory and his remarriage. So the moral premise applies to all the main characters, even the antagonist Hans Gruber. Let's watch the final climactic scene where this, you, you'll see this stuff here on the right and think back about how this was represented back early in Act One. <laughs> Happy trails, Hans. That's not a hostage. All right, so there's a great example of how the moral premise statement is represented uh, throughout the movie. And there's just tons of stuff like that in Die Hard in all successful movies, which we don't have time to go into at all. But take a look at it. I mean, the music and everything in the whole movie is that way. All right, here's the fifth secret of all successful stories. And that's a story's consistent application of a true moral premise. And how do you spell consistent? Well, you apply the moral premise concept, as simple and elegant as it is, you apply it to the character arc, to the acts, to the sequences, to the scenes and to the individual lines, to the photography, to the music, the sets, the wardrobe, the props, the editing, the packaging, and yes, even the marketing. And we don't have time obviously now to go into all that. But as we go through these different episodes and we look at these different ways that the moral premise applies to the whole craft of movie making and, and novel writing, uh, think about this and think about this consistency element and how the moral premise can apply at every level of the art. All right, this concludes the third episode of Moral Premise Storycraft Training. The subject's been the moral premise statement. We hope that you apply it to all your stories, and in all you write, please vanquish fear and bestow hope. I'm Stan Williams. See you next time.